The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this lunch and lecture. Today's topic, Understanding How Nutrition Fits Us Today. Your presenter, Rebecca Kirby, MD, MSRD. Hi, welcome everybody. It's nice to see some new folks along with our alumni. We're going to talk about nutrition today, but that's a surprise. Uh, and if I seem sort of laid back, that's because I just came back from two weeks of vacation in England where the sun shine for two weeks. I get back to uh, Wichita and I haven't seen the sun yet. So how do you like that for reversal of fortune, so to speak? Well, I wanted just to give you a little background, maybe a refresher course for a lot of you guys, on um, why we're about nutrition here at the center. It all started way back in 1975. Uh, that's over 30 years ago. And a nutrition grant was given by Mrs. Garvey to Dr. Hugh Reardon, who is our late uh, founder here. He was a psychiatrist. And that got the ball rolling. And now we're uh, a comprehensive integrative medicine clinic using uh, nutrition and studying biochemical individuality, the nutritional needs of each person. And uh, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this because that nutritional uniqueness is key to um, the way you approach your own biochemistry. And then um, these present domes and the pyramid were all constructed in 1984. And when I came here four years ago, I thought, well, now that's a perfectly logical structure, the nice geodesic dome that was a Buckminster or Fuller uh, architectural design, because here we are in Tornado Alley. So wouldn't you prefer to be in a kind of a rounded structure? Here at the center, we actually have multiple divisions. We're not just a clinic. We have a research division. We have a lab, uh, clinical laboratory where you get your blood drawn and tests are done. And when we have the educational service that includes our Health Hunter newsletter. And one of the things that we do here at the center is we actually approach people from a different perspective. We're not just looking at diseases. We're looking at underlying causes. And that's what we hope to find and correct is the underlying causes to people's symptoms or illnesses. And we do that in part by measuring levels of their nutrients. Okay, nutrients. Because if you took a hundred different people and measure their nutrient levels, say of zinc or B6 or one of the various nutrients, you'd find at least a tenfold difference in each person's need. So that's where it's important to understand how each of us is different biochemically, and that means each of us have different nutritional requirements. And that's because we're all different genetically. We, we, we look different, so we know that you know our noses are different, our livers are different, and our cells are different, and then all that activity that's going on inside the cells where you have your nutrient utilization, that's all different too. And these theories were put forth and uh, shown by Dr. Roger Williams, who I had the opportunity of working for way back in the 70s. Uh, he discovered a couple of the vitamins, the B vitamin, panathenic acid, and he named uh, an isolated folic acid too. And he put these concepts together uh, about how it is important to understand the uniqueness of the nutrients requirement for each person. So that's one of the things we study here. Well, why is it important to know about the nutrition, what's going on at that cellular level? Well, that's because nutrition affects how we are healthy and how we develop diseases. Um, even the Surgeon General uh, took the top ten list of the leading causes of death in the United States, and you can see heart disease is still up there as uh, number one, that's for both men and women. Um, 
cancer, stroke, uh, injury, emphysema, pneumonia, diabetes, suicide, chronic liver disease, and atherosclerosis are all um, in the uh, top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. So, of those, the Surgeon General said at least five are affected by nutrition. The italics show you what the Surgeon General considered the five uh, preventable causes. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and atherosclerosis. And perhaps I would uh, conjecture chronic liver um, and maybe even pneumonia. Because if you, are, you die of pneumonia, you may have an underlying nutritional uh, deficiency or inadequacy that is impairing your immune system. So nutrition is important in our long-term um, disease prevention. And that's just the point is, wouldn't it be good if we worked more on preventing disease? Because we, in traditional medicine, are most likely working with diseases and working on sickness, so what we call sickness care, not really health care. And Dr. Reardon used to say it here at the center, we try to work in health care, not just sickness care. So we would like to be able to treat diseases that are preventable, you know, through modifiable behaviors. And what are some of those behaviors? Well, if you could change the behavior of U.S. citizens, uh, get them to eat better and be more active, you could prevent 300,000 deaths a year. And actually that statistic keeps increasing. If you um, got people to quit tobacco products, you'd, get, uh, you'd prevent 400,000 deaths a year. Alcohol overuse, uh, you'd prevent 100,000 deaths a year. And the uh, importance of diet in inactivity is going to outstrip tobacco pretty soon. Okay, well what the heck has happened to our diet? Why, where are we going afoul of uh, good nutrition? Well, things have changed a lot from the way we have eaten since the last century. Um, right? You know, compared to what happened in the 1900s, we eat more protein from animal sources. It's more available. Um, we get more carbohydrates from sugar. We eat less fiber. That kind of goes with eating more sugar. You get less fiber. And in fact, the, uh, we have a decrease in the fiber consumption from our, just our grains, for instance, as, you know, uh, by 50%. And that's you know, decreasing the amount of whole foods, uh, whole grains as opposed to uh, refined grains. And then we're eating less fruits and vegetables, therefore getting less fiber. And interestingly enough, our calories are about the same. Uh, all, However, currently, uh, they're telling us about 61% of Americans are overweight or obese. And even though we were eating the same amount of calories, of course, what's happening is there are different kinds of calories, like we just said, more sugar, less fiber, and of course, we're not as physically active. So, one of the things that our government does to kind of keep track of things is the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, uh, has a uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. It's an ongoing survey uh, looking at what Americans eat. It's called the NHANES for short. And every now and then, they stop and calculate all the data and release a bulletin and tell something about what, what we're doing. It's usually bad news, I hate to say. Uh, but the intake of five fruits and vegetables a day, which is the recommendation by the Na National Cancer Institute, less than 10%, less than 10% of the population uh, actually gets in five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I mean, that's, that's a really small amount of people who actually eat five fruits and vegetables a day. And all of you probably have qualified just by today. You've eaten a vegetable salad. Uh, you've eaten some vegetables in your soups. You've eaten some fruit salad. So you may have already uh, be that, that 10%. Um, white potatoes account for a fifth of all the vegetables consumed. So all those different kinds of fries and chips. Uh, potato is a vegetable, so when you lump it in with vegetables consumed, um, it is a huge chunk of the actual vegetables eaten. Okay, in the survey, they said 50% of Americans didn't eat any fruit. 
every day. Intake of fiber, they found, was less than half recommended. It was around 11 grams of fiber, and um, it's recommended that we have 25 to 35 grams of fiber. Well, you could get 11 grams of fiber uh, fairly easily. If you eat whole grains, you eat beans, you eat fruits and vegetables, but of course if 50% aren't eating fruit, that's problem. Okay, milk consumption by children under five years of age they found was down by 16%. Well, what are those kids drinking? Um, one of the surveys they found that one in five of little kids, one in two-year-olds, actually drink soda. So, you know, a lot less milk consumption. They're getting sodas, fruit juice, sweetened, um, sweetened drinks. And then it gets worse. Okay, soda consumption among teenagers Teen girls has doubled during the period that they analyzed from 1978 to 1998. Then they looked at teen boys. And uh, in 1978, an average teenager uh, drank about seven ounces of soda today. I mean soda each day. Now, today, a uh, uh, male teen consumes about three times that amount. So that's a lot of empty calories. And some of these statistics you can find, um, I've referenced the source where I've gotten them. Now, a lot of this, these sweetened sodas are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. And that statistic is really astounding. You go from 1970 to 1990, um, this publication found that the high fructose corn syrup consumption increased by 1,000%. So, that's a lot of sodas and miscellaneous stuff. And if you ever, you know, read labels to try to avoid high fructose corn syrup, you know how many products it's, it's in. Well, um, one of the other uh, surveys I found, just a popular survey in a Sunday supplement, said that 9 out of 10 Americans purchase convenience food. Actually, I'm surprised that's not 10 out of 10. Um, and that chips are the favorite snack. That's 3 out of 4 adults. And two-thirds of mothers choose their snacks based on their child's request. And, of course, there's a lot of pressure by advertising to entice children to ask mom to buy certain things. And these usually aren't foods that are high in nutrient value. They're high in some sort of taste uh, sensation. And also, two-thirds of Americans, they found snack after dinner usually in front of the TV. And that's a very bad behavior because what happens if you watch TV or read while you eat? You, you're not listening to your body's signals when it's time to stop eating. You tend to just, you know, kind of go with the flow, you know, even with the tempo of, of whatever you're watching. So that's a very bad habit. And that's, you know, contributes along with our inactivity to uh, the overweight issue. Now, the latest research I found was about eating out. Um, Americans now spend half their food budget on dining out. And uh, if you looked at it from the restaurant people's perspective, it was pretty good for them because there was a 67% increase in the amount of money they make just over in the last 10 years. So people really aren't staying home and cooking. They're eating out. Now, the problem with that is that restaurant meals average about 1,000 to 1,500 calories a day, I mean, per meal. Now, that's a lot of calories. If you're an average-sized woman, about 125 to 145 pounds, um, 1,500 to 1,800 calories a day might be all you could consume without gaining weight. And if, if that's your, uh, if you sit down for your evening meal, uh, unless you've been fasting all day, you're going to probably go over your calorie allotment for the day just, just by eating out. It is a real challenge to, to eat healthy and uh, have a regular diet of restaurant food. Um, and this is what they decided when they added up all the statistics that women who eat out five times a week eat an average of 290 extra calories a day. So that adds up to about 21 and a half pounds a year. So that's just eating out five times a week. You can gain 21 pounds a year. And 
you know, it's pretty effortless. <laughs> now, um, one of the things we, we always ask ourselves is, um, are we getting enough nutrition from our food? Now, we, you know, we have the calorie dilemma when we're eating out, but um, we also have the dilemma in the, all the foods that we're choosing to eat because uh, when the government surveys what we're actually eating and then calculates our nutrient content, we're really falling short. And they're calculating from the survey uh, the nutrient content compared to the recommended daily allowance dietary allowance. And that, that is a amount of nutrients that is considered adequate for most healthy people. So it's a kind of a nominal amount. Okay, so are we Americans at least getting that nominal amount in our diet? The answer is no. Th these are the, the statistics on Americans who are not eating the RDA of like vitamin A. 39% of men are not getting it, and 44% of women are not. Uh, vitamin C, 39% of men are not getting their, R RDA is only about 60 milligrams, and 44% of women aren't getting that. that. That's the crowd that are not eating any kind of fruit. Um, vitamin E, it's even higher because those are in whole grains. B12 is uh, from animal sources, so men do a little bit better. There's only 12% not getting the RDA, uh, but for women it's up to 30%. B6, very important uh, B vitamin, and over half, uh, both men and women, are not even getting the RDA. Magnesium, look at that, 66% of men and 76% of women not getting the RDA. Well, men, um, actually, men are bigger meat eaters, and things like your uh, B12 and uh, some of your products like your magnesium, and, well, particularly zinc. Zinc is found in meats, and they do better. Well, 68% is not great, but women really fall behind with uh, 83%. So it has a lot to do with uh, quality of food. And calcium, uh, we, we, you know, we talk about osteoporosis, and yet we're not even getting enough calcium in our diet. 55% uh, of men and 78% of women are not even getting the RDA of calcium. So how, how would you go about getting these things? Look, look where the foods, uh, what foods are that contain these nutrients. Vitamin C, uh, you just need to eat some cantaloupe, broccoli, green peppers, citrus fruits, strawberries, for example. B12, you have to get from animal sources. Uh, B6, beans, bananas, potatoes. You'd think with all the potatoes Americans were eating, they might get enough B6. Uh, but after it gets cooked, uh, they're going to lose some of that nutrient. Magnesium, seeds. We're not, we're not big seed eaters. Cocoa, uh, there's good news. Wheat and oat bran, so that's the whole grain. Almonds, spinach, beans, uh, zinc, uh, Oysters is a really good source, but also beef, uh, beans and peas, spinach, wheat germ. Wheat germ, so that's the whole grain. And calcium. Well, we think of calcium traditionally in dairy products. Uh, tofu is also processed with calcium, so it's a good source. And you get a little calcium in your sesame seeds and, of course, your dark green leafy vegetables, spinach, and beans. So what, what do these things have in common? The most important nutrition message. They're whole foods. You know, you didn't see any packaged foods up here, any fruit drinks. You didn't see any um, concoctions, so to speak, any donuts. <laughs> um, and we're going to kind of play a Where's Waldo right now. You see these funny little numbers. Uh, on your very last page of your handout is... The top 20 dietary tips, since we are what we eat. Uh, in our April Health Hunter, we uh, are celebrating 20 years of our newsletter. And so I put together some important nutritional messages. And um, as you can see, nutritional message 16 was eat more whole foods and in good variety. And what are whole foods? Well, they're the foods that nature prepared for us. 
and you get more vitamins, minerals, you get fiber, and then you get things that we haven't clearly identified yet, like our phytochemicals. We call them phytonutrients. And you get healthy fats. You get a lot less unhealthy fats, and you get more colorful foods. Uh, and the more colorful, the better. And remember, no matter how much, how many supplements you take, it doesn't take the place of a healthy diet. Because you've got to start out with food because supplements are re replenishing nutrients that we already know about. But in our foods, we continue to get important ingredients that we don't really know. We haven't well identified. We haven't well um, delineated their, their uh, health consequence. But we know that they have health benefits. And now we lump a lot of them under the term phyto. Uh, chemicals because phyto means plant. So when you look at uh, some of the most important f eating and nutrition practices, I actually put the, the going from 20 to 1. I started out with 20 being one of the most important things to do is to actually chew your food. I know that sounds sort of silly, but if, if you actually chew your food, you break it up so that you can get your nutrients out and you can get those enzymes in to digest the food so that you can benefit from the nutrients. Because actually, th there are some foods that uh, you have to, to destroy the tough cell, those tough vegetable cell walls to get nutrients out, like, for instance, carrots. Uh, they need a lot of chewing. And cooked carrots, you can actually get more vitamin A or beta carotene out of than raw carrots because the cooking process even helps you even more. But chewing is, is definitely where to start. Going organic when you can is very helpful in your diet. And, and organic is, is getting much more uh, available. And the reason it's helpful is as we have found out with research, there's, again, these substances in organic foods that may even help fight cancer because the plants that, or the, that have to grow without the um, aid of pesticides and herbicides put out beneficial chemicals um, to you know, ward off the bugs and the fungi and all the other, and they in turn may help us with warding off some um, of the, the um, oxidative and damaging effects of cancer. So stay tuned, more research coming. And another thing you may want to do with suggestion 13 is eat some beneficial bacteria every day. And you may have heard the term probiotic. Uh, it's very uh, popular right now with regards to promotions of different yogurts. Uh, yogurts are fermented milk products that are fermented with beneficial bacteria. And in our process in the U.S., we pasteurize it after that. And so in order to have live bacteria, they have to be re-inoculated. So most yogurts will have live active cultures that they've re-inoculated. And these beneficial bacteria provide disease resistance uh, by helping maintain a healthy colon. They help with fighting allergies. Uh, they've uh, found research to help prevent eczema in babies by providing beneficial bacteria to both the mothers and the babies. And if you're interested in probiotics, there's a lecture upstairs. I gave a whole 50 minutes of all the research on good bugs. Um, and you might try, suggestion number 10, is going meatless for a week. And, and that doesn't mean that you take a plate, your usual plate of foods, and just detract them, uh, uh, detach the meat from it. You actually explore those whole grains and those combinations of like brown rice and beans and whole grains and all your different legumes. Uh, maybe uh, try some soy products and eat more seeds. Uh, and, and actually try a varied menu that is just vegetarian. That way you're going to get all that fiber. And it's just a good experiment to kind of add variety to your cooking. Now, um, number two, suggestion number two is eat at home more. And uh, that's, that's right up there close to number one because you saw that statistic that, you know, 50% of the food budget is eating out. Well, 
I, I've actually encountered a lot of folks who don't know how to cook. And it's, it's a fun thing to rediscover or discover for the first time. And that way you have the benefit of actually getting some whole foods in your diet if you cook. And if you sit down and eat with family and friends and enjoy a meal together, there's a lot of benefits. Uh, actually, they've even shown research on how much better you digest if you actually have a very calm environment. And one of the things we need to think about is turning off the television when we eat. So we're promoting the, uh, the nutrient-dense foods that are your whole foods. Well, whole, what are the non-whole foods? Well, those are the ones that are refined, that uh, exist no longer in nature, nothing that looks recognizable quite. And in the United States, about 60% of our calories come from refined sugars. Uh, we talked about the fructose, which is about 20 to 25% of calories. Um, we get calories from um, the separated fats and oils. So that's no longer a whole food. When you take a, a corn or an almond and you extract it down to the oil, that's no longer a whole food. You're missing the protein and the fiber. And uh, we have a big diet of extracted oils. And, of course, we have a lot of white flour and white rice in our diet as well, about 20 to 25 percent of our calories. So those are non-whole foods, and what do they remind you of? They're their ingredients for making cookies. You've got, you've got fat, you know, flour, white flour, and white sugar. So really, we're just kind of eating 1,500 calories a day from cookie ingredients, refined grains, refined fats, and refined sugars. And in those surveys, they found, of course, that we're eating too few of the whole foods from fruits and vegetables, uh, and, and we're totally avoiding whole foods that have whole fats in them. You know, we, we eat the separated fats and oils, but we're avoiding nuts and avocados because they have fat in them. But they have good fat. So this is where quality is more important than quantity. And we're, we're doing really poorly on eating whole grains, only 1% to 3% of our calories. Okay, so I want to show you a little bit, when you think about these foods, th these are nutrients that are fueling all these biochemical processes in your body that make your body tick. So when you're eating refined foods, you're, you're giving your body less of the ingredients it needs to do all the work it needs. And here's an example of just what happens when you refine flour. So you've got, uh, th these are what we call nutricircles. And if you, the little red inner circle is the RDA of these particular nutrients. So visually, you see that you get the RDA of an awful lot of nutrients and then beyond the RDA of a lot of nutrients uh, in your whole wheat grain. Now, this, uh, these are amino acids, so you can see the protein you get here. Uh, got your fiber. This is some minerals, more minerals, um, the major minerals, and then your uh, vitamins. Okay, so when you refine flour, you, you lose a lot of protein because you're taking out the bran, which, uh, or taking off the bran, uh, which has a lot of protein. And um, you're losing a whole lot. See how this inner circle kind of is getting a little bit lighter. Um, and and it, it happened back in the 40s when uh, the refining process of flowers had been going on long enough that they discovered people were getting deficiency diseases. And so it was mandated that they add back uh, the thiamine, uh, the niacin, let's see, the riboflavin, uh, there's your niacin, and now they add folic acid uh, and iron. So those look good because they're added back. Not, not because they're there, but because they're not there. So, now, when I was talking about fats, here's another example. And uh, this, this NutraCircle blew up the RDA amount. So this is the recommended daily amount right here. And this is corn. It's got a nice amount of B vitamins, some minerals, uh, proteins. Okay, so you make corn oil out of it. 
And what do you have left? Well, you just, you, not much. Uh, you're going to have vitamin E if it's added back. And uh, these are just a couple of the fats, uh, linoleic acid and some of the omega-3 acids. So you can see why there's a benefit to eating the food as nature intended as often as you can because you get a big blast of nutrients. And then there's the orange saga. Okay, one, one of the things that in the top 20 hits <clears throat> I talk about um, is, is eating fruit as opposed to drinking the juices. You, you get much more nutrient benefit. It doesn't rock and roll your blood sugar. So kind of put those juices on hold and actually eat the fruit. Now here's, here's uh, again, the recommended daily allowance. It's this circle right here. And you can see actually a pretty good amount of proteins in an orange. That because your orange, you know, it's got all those little little fibers and those sections in it. Well, those are all got protein in them. Uh, and then you've got your vitamins, you've got your minerals, looking pretty good. Okay, so this is what happens when you get the juice. Well, pretty much the protein's gone, um, and you've got a real diminishing amount of the water soluble. Uh, nutrients and then the fiber. Uh, see how good the fiber was here. Fiber's kind of gone away. So eat the, eat your eat your fruit. Uh, okay, now <clears throat> that's the orange. Okay, a little less nutrition when you got your juice. What about orange soda? <laughs> Is that a whole food? Yeah, it. Looks pretty pitiful, doesn't it? And that's, you know, we, we, we're, uh, U.S. and those kids, all, they're big consumers of those sweetened drinks. And, you know, they think, well, it tastes like a fruit. This must be a fruit group, but not quite. Well, now, one of the other advantages of, of eating whole foods, you hear about the glycemic index a lot. And that's when I was saying if you eat the actual fruit as opposed to drink the juice, it keeps your blood sugar steady. Well, keeping the blood sugar steady is the principle behind the glycemic index. So a low glycemic index number is a good thing because it doesn't shoot your blood sugar up. It keeps it at a moderate level. And those foods are usually whole foods. So if you want to avoid those high glycemic foods, you want to eat less of those processed foods, you know, like the white bread, white rice. You want to eat less sugary stuff and less of the fruit drinks. And don't forget sports drinks. Those are a bunch of sugar, too. And when you want to eat more of your fruits and vegetables, but your non-starchy ones, uh, even though potato is a vegetable, it does have effect of spiking your blood sugar, so you're better off with your non-starchy fruits and vegetables. And fruits you can eat and not mess with your blood sugar too much. Um, it's sweet, but that sugar is tempered by the fact that you're eating it with all those nutrients and all that fiber and all that protein, as opposed to drinking the juice. That, you know, no fiber very little protein, that will shoot your blood sugar up. So eat more of the non-starchy fruits and vegetables, the whole foods, and beans and peas. We sort of forget it. We call them legumes. We sort of forget about beans. They're very, very nutritious, high in fiber, um, and there's a huge variety. You know, if you grew up eating pinto beans, you don't have to eat them anymore. <laughs> you can eat kidney beans or lima beans or black-eyed peas. Those are one of my favorites. Peanuts are actually a legume, too. Uh, and eat more nuts and seeds. Um, the, Dr. Davis did a great lecture on nuts. If, if you have any um, doubts about how nutritious they are and how the research has showed that that beneficial fat is actually a good thing. We, we can quit being so afraid of nuts because they have a fat content. That fat is good fat. And um, we forget about eating nuts and seeds in our diet as much, um, especially just by themselves, you know, not encrusted in like a granola bar or something, but just by themselves. And of course, eating more whole grains. So let's talk a little bit about fat because you hear a lot about the trans fat now that it's mandatory on the label. And there's a reason for that because heart disease 
is our number one killer that we saw in the very beginning of the top ten leading causes of death. Well, heart disease is the top one. Now, we understand that we increase our risk for heart disease when we increase our bad LDL cholesterol and we decrease our good HDL cholesterol. And what, how do we do that? Well, we do that by eating trans fats. So all those years we were eating margarine and shortening, we were actually uh, doubling our risk of heart disease as opposed to just eating natural saturated fats. So butter's back on the menu, in other words. And this is where we were getting those trans fats. Cookies, cakes, pies, that made up about 40%. Margarines, about 17%. Uh, frying foods, you know, they're fried in uh, partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, fast foods, you know, snack foods are made with partially hydrogenated. Some um, household, uh, well, all the shortening and salad dressings, uh, even candy. And we actually get some naturally uh, in our animal foods. So now trans fats are labeled. We realize that they're really lethal. Um, and one thing you want to be on the lookout as you read your food labels, there is um, there's the ability that they can actually have less than 0.5 grams of trans fats and say trans fat free on the front of the label. So you want to flip it over and read your list of ingredients because there still may be some partially hydrogenated fats in there. And I would say zero tolerance for partially hydrogenated fats might be a really good idea. And uh, we, the fast food people don't have to label whether they have trans fats, although there's a little um, competition going on on those who are going to be trans fat free first, which is really nice. Um, and don't be fooled by something that says a vegetable oil is cholesterol free because a vegetable oil never had cholesterol in it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, you see that a lot, you know, like, um, well, any, anything that's a vegetable product is not going to have cholesterol. Cholesterol is made by animals, so you have to eat an animal or an animal product to get cholesterol. Um, and if it says cooked in vegetable oil, that's okay, but vegetable oil may be a partially hydrogenated vegetable, and that's what you're trying to avoid, is this hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. Okay, so to avoid those trans fats, you'd be surprised how quickly they add up. If you had a donut for breakfast, you'd get 3.2 grams of trans fat. French fries for lunch, you'd have 7.7 .7 grams, and that's already over 10 grams of trans fats. And... Um, the research has shown that as little as five grams of trans fats a day raises your risk of heart disease by 25%. So that's why you may want to just practice zero tolerance and be sure you read your ingredient label. So there are healthy fats, uh, and, and you, the, the fish oils have your EPA and DHA. We like to call them by those little nicknames because their scientific name is about that long. Um, and these are the omega-3 fatty acids. And interestingly enough, half the dry weight of your brain is made up of those fatty acids. And um, those come primarily from fish, fish that swim in cold water. A Dutch study found that, that when they looked for over five years at 1,600 different subjects, that the more fish eaten, the better the brain function as people age. So fish really is brain food. So eat more fatty fish that swim in cold water. That's like your salmon, your mackerel, your sardines, even cold water trout, tuna to some degree. Um, and then there's always the precaution about mercury. And the government does tell us which, which um, seafood they would ex want pregnant women to avoid because of the mercury content. So to me, that just meant we all should probably avoid it. And high on the list is king mackerel. So mackerels are not all created equal. Uh, shark, which I'm kind of probably have been avoiding anyway. Uh, tile fish, I'm not sure what a tile fish is. Um, and one of the things that they recommend pregnant women eat less of, that's like only six ounces a week, is white albacore tuna. 
the regular canned tuna has less mercury than the white albacore. So avoid your king mackerel, your shark, your tilefish, and um, if you like tuna, don't eat the white albacore every day. Now, some of the other things where we get really healthy fats are like in avocados, olives, chop up any kind of nuts. You can chop the up nuts and put them on your salads, avocados in your salads, olives on your salads, sunflower and sesame seeds instead of salad dressing, which is a refined oil. And also, you want to eat colorful. Those phytonutrients we were talking about that we haven't described all of them yet, a lot of them are pigments. So the more colorful you can eat, the better. And you, uh, the, the purples and blues are like your blueberries and your blackberries, your plums. There's a lot of really good research on blueberries, actually good for the brain as well. And green, uh, as many green things as you can think of. Um, kale, spinach, Brussels sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, any kind of sprout. Uh, broccoli, cabbage, and red. Strawberries, beets, beets, red peppers, cherries, pink grapefruit, uh, watermelon, the oranges and the yellows, uh, oranges, obviously, corn, sweet potatoes, carrots, apricots, just lots of colorful foods. And then, lo and behold, one of the other colorful foods that has no color is actually very high in some um, what we call radical scavenging um, nutrients or, or phytonutrients. These colorful antioxidant uh, foods are, are white foods. Garlic is really top there uh, up on, way on the list. Even white grapes, cauliflower, even though they don't have color, they have good antioxidant potential. And that's the important thing when you think about nutrients. When you eat whole foods, you're going to get a broad spectrum of nutrients. And the reason that's important is nutrients do not act alone. In a lot of the studies that you find uh, that get criticized are when they give a nutrient like they would give a drug. Well, that just doesn't work because nutrients work as a team. You have to have them all there for the machinery to, to run appropriately. And when you have deficiencies, you usually just don't have one deficiency of a nutrient. You have several. They don't occur in isolation. And after you've had a deficiency, a small one for a while, it will cause, it's kind of like a trickle down effect. It will cause uh, problems in other biochemical pathways. So that's why you want the full spectrum of nutrients, the, the nutrient team. It's like you wouldn't send out the quarterback to do the job on the field and leave the rest of the team on the bench and expect them to get anywhere with the opposing team. You need everybody out on the field. And a good uh, reminder of how important nutrient teamwork is, is to look at the research on bone health. And we, we give a lot of talk about how important calcium is in bone health, but you need more than calcium. You need calcium, phosphorus, strontium, magnesium, zinc, copper, manganese, boron, and silicon, just to name a few. You need protein uh, to have good bones. You need vitamin C, D, and K. You need vitamins B12 and folic acid. So there's more than just calcium and vitamin D uh, and a little smattering of magnesium to keep your bones strong. It's a nutrient teamwork um, that needs to all be there for healthy bone metabolism. And you want to avoid refined foods uh, and minimize heavy, heavy metal exposure when you're keeping your bones healthy as well. So again, the best way to get those is to approach it with whole foods. That way you're getting your nutrients the way nature packed them in. And that way you have the optimal opportunity to also get those nutrients, like I said, that we haven't discovered yet. And one thing I wanted to say about eating whole foods, you don't have to be a perfectionist. Uh, aim for 80%, and that's, that's pretty good. If you do 80% whole foods uh, most of the time, you're, you're getting a, a good, well-rounded uh, diet. Make sure you're getting plenty of fruits and vegetables, colorful ones, uh, and think about seeds and nuts and those uh, beans. And then just a few other quick health tips. Uh, eat regularly. 
the research shows over and over again that breakfast really is important. Your mother was right. Eating breakfast is the way to start the day. Don't forget about drinking plenty of water, uh, getting lots of fluid, increasing your physical activity. Um, that's important in nutrition because you've got to get these nutrients eaten, digested in the bloodstream, and that blood needs to go to all those parts of the body uh, where nutrients are being um, used. So physical activity can help with that. And uh, you, you, th you think, well, why are we going to talk about sleep? Um, I just want to remind you that sleep really matters. Uh, the research shows that not getting sleep is actually a risk factor for obesity. So besides helping our bodies to recuperate from uh, the stressors of the day, it's a very important health issue to actually give your chance, give your body a chance to get some sleep. And remember to de-stress. That, that can help with getting you towards some sleep. And um, dietary tip number five was to take a phytonutrient pause. When you're de-stressing, one of the things you can do, and since I was over in England, I did a lot of this, you can stop and drink tea. Um, we know that there's polyphenols in green tea. Uh, we're learning a lot about black tea has some benefits as well. If you don't uh, do caffeine, you can even just stop and take some herbal tea. And um, you can also try for a very calming effect is something called walnut tea. <laughs> Dr. Reardon used to teach this. Um, you take a walnut, an English walnut, you put it in your teacup, you fill your teacup with boiling water, let that walnut steep, and when the water's cool enough, you drink that water, and then you can eat your walnut. Actually, that walnut has serotonin in it, so you feel nice and calm. And it really tastes pretty good, too. Uh, and I found the original research and the uh, newest research on foods that have a significant serotonin content. And um, the, the reason this got discovered is when the health professionals would order uh, urine tests for documenting serotonin in uh, patients, the laboratories told them to avoid these foods because it has been shown by laboratory analysis that these foods have a significant serotonin content. And that's your walnuts, uh, pecans, plantains, we don't eat much of those in the U.S., pineapple, bananas, kiwi, plums, that probably should mean prunes as well, uh, tomatoes, avocados, and dates. And all of those are whole foods too. So that's a good way to get a little extra uh, pause to help you de-stress. Now, the number one tip on the top ten dietary tips, I've said it once, I'll say it many times again, a dark green leafy vegetable a day keeps the doctor away. We thought apples were really nutritious, the dark greens, take it away. And here's your NutraCircle again. Here's the RDA right, right there. Now, that is almost solid. You almost get the RDA of every nutrient uh, just by eating a dark green leafy vegetable. And then there's just tons more of all of these nutrients beyond just the RDA um, from a dark green leafy vegetable. So that's spinach, um, chard, turnip greens, uh, collard greens, all those nice dark things. So that so when you're choosing like for salads and stuff, you know, go for the really colorful dark green uh, vegetables. And um, if you'd like to learn more about all the different topics related to nutrition, we talk about uh, not only nutrition here, but uh, the relationship of nutrients and specific diseases. Uh, through our lunch and lecture series and what's available in our Health Hunter newsletter. We have a great library. Jan talked about our tour. Um, our bookstore has tapes and books. And um, sometime you might be interested, when it's not quite so muddy, to visit our certified organic garden. Uh, there'll be little lettuces coming out soon, some of those wonderful dark green leafy things, uh, to, uh, to enjoy out of our restaurant. And we have a, a website if you just want to explore more about what it's like uh, here at the center. And this is one of my favorite quotes I'd like to end with. 
Attributed to Thomas Edison way back in the 1800s, the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will interest their patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Now, I just think that's a great future to look forward to. Thank you. And we have time for questions. Anybody? Oh, uh, got a question up here. Microphone's coming. A question over here. Uh, that wallet you're talking about that you put the boiled water over and drink, can you just go to the store and buy walnuts and, and break them up, and then that's what you use? Half of it in a cup of boiled mm -hmm. water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, and um, English walnuts have a pretty good serotonin content or, or, as well as the black walnuts. I just find that brewing English walnuts taste better in the brew, but if you want to enjoy eating, you can do either. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Dr. Reardon gave this lecture on depression, and um, he had the restaurant make up a little Dixie cup of, of the brewed walnut for everybody, and it was really interesting, because usually after lunch and lecture, it's everybody's, you know, up out of their seats and milling to get out. After we all drank this little cup of our, our serotonin spiked walnut tea, everybody just sat there. It was like, wow. Really zoned out. I have a question about the uh, self juiced versus juice. You had said something about the apple was better than the, than the juice itself. Were you referring to the commercial juice, or are you also saying that the nutrients are not as good in a juice from a juicer? Oh, well, now, if you have the opportunity to make your own juice, you will have the ability to get more nutrients just by, because any time uh, a fruit or vegetable has been through a fairly strenuous refining process, you're going to lose some water-soluble vitamins because a lot of those vitamins, like vitamin C, are very susceptible to light and to heat. However, even in your home juicing process, you're going to lose your fiber and your protein. And, and I always say, you know, juice if, if you'd like to, but take a bit of that wonderful pulp that's left behind and put it back into your, into your juice. I wondered about the, the uh, roller coaster that you... Oh, you mean as far as the glycemic index? Uh, as far as the glycemic index goes, if you don't have your protein and your fiber in that juice, you know, that you're getting when you eat your whole fruit, you're still going to have some uh, blood sugar spikes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Do we have time for one more? Any more questions? We're going to have a drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the last picture of the spinach and nutrition of the spinach, uh -huh. is that a 20 ounce? 20 uh, ounce of spinach? Or two. It, it's a serving, so yeah, it's 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 like what you get in like a half a cup. Okay. Of cooked, okay. Yeah, half a cup cooked or like a cup of raw. I mean, it's they're really power packed nutrients, and and uh, they look so much better than even the apple. That's why I say one dark green leafy vegetable a day keeps the doctor away. Yeah. One more question. Well, that walnut. You would shell that walnut. And you would shell that walnut. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because they make really good dye with the shell. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, and that, that's a good activity, uh, de stressing activity. Crack those nuts. The preceding program was presented by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International in the Bright Spot for Health Lunch and Lecture Series. To inquire about additional health related information available on DVD, audio CD, VHS, or audio cassette, simply call 316 682 3100 or drop by 3100 North Hillside in Wichita, Kansas. To discover more about the center and what we have to offer, be sure and visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.